while at times seeming to eschew the potential limits of human perception, William Blake's poetic vision is nonetheless, uh, sorry, remarkable for its commitment to the materiality of human form and sensuality. In fact, the very corporeality of Blake's metaphor expression insists that we understand his vision of human experience as essentially and necessarily mediated through the body. S such devotion extends equally, I suggest, to his expansive understanding and expression of temporality. In particular, the simultaneity of Blake's vision regarding imaginative creation collapses a wide range of temporal figurations, the heartbeat, the syllable, history, uh, geological time, and even eternity, which is not at odds with his invocation of diurnal modality as part of human experience. Uh, slide, please. <clears throat> uh, for, as Blake notes, quote, all the great events of time start forth and are conceived in such a period. Within a moment, a pulsation of the artery, unquote. Using Alison Kafer's conception of a crypt time as a starting point, I, uh, sorry, today I examine Blake's, what I'm calling radical temporalities through his construction of non-normative uh, non embodiment and the senses in Milton, a poem, a work that imagines all types of physical labor, forging, hammering, plowing, sowing, reaping, pressing, and printing, of course. Blake's approach to time, I argue, opens new ontological possibilities for a critical disability framework of romantic production, especially in terms of non-normative embodiment for both the, the poet and for his readers. By crypt time, I mean the variability of temporal experience, the variety of physical movement and mental processes that do not meet arbitrary standards of social and cultural expectation. Slide. Kafer has suggested that, quote, rather than blend disabled bodies and minds to meet the clock, crypt time bends the clock to meet disabled bodies and minds. As a work that is deeply invested in poetic form, Blake's Milton anticipates a rendering of crypt time that disability scholars uh, such as Kafer, uh, Robert McRuer, Margaret Price, Ellen Samuels, and others have explored in recent years. Blake's strange, prophetic, and often frustrating epic offers windows through which disability may serve not as a barrier, lack, or weakness, but as a modality of creative potential founded upon disruption and difference. How then might we then consider Blake's radical approach to temporality and alternative sensual modalities as to expand reading practices and creative expression to include non-normative embodiments? In order to do this, he must recognize that Milton is largely sorry, founded upon Blake's rejection of Newtonian materialism, and I'll return to that notion later. In Blake's poem, human experience in the, in the vegetable world finds time and space divided in the wake of Isaac Newton's conception of temporal apprehension and measurement. But a part of Blake's long project was always to unite these realms of experience going as far back as the songs. The material, sorry, negotiation and instantiation of the relationship between the temporal and spatial realms makes Blake unique among the romantics as much as the union of image and text that so defines his work. Many critics have sought to expand upon what W.J.T. Mitchell has called, quote, Blake's composite art. That is his examination of Blake's engagement with the so-called sister arts. Uh, so, I'm sorry, slide. As Mitchell writes, quote, the personification of a painting in poetry as sisters was no accident. It expressed concisely the conviction that the two arts were daughters of the same nature and that they provided 
complementary representations of the basic modalities in which reality was apprehended. Space and time, body and soul, sense and intellect, and in the realm of aesthetics, dulce et utile, unquote. Mitchell goes on to note Blake's project to unify these uh, complementary modalities, not just philosophically, but crucially through his, his illuminated books. Mitchell's reading, built in part on Jean Hagstrom's approach to the sister arts in the 18th century, has long been the, the critical standard, and its logic has framed Blake studies uh, now for decades. More recently, Tora Brilo's subtle examination of the wider uh, media ecology in which Blake was working has helped us to understand that that system's, quote, interdependence of media forms and offers us a corrective to Hagstrom's earlier bifurcated rendering of the sister arts tradition. In terms of my own reading of Blake and his approach to temporality in Milton more specifically, I take as my starting place Brylow's emphasis on the moment rather than the period. And though my focus differs somewhat, I am moved by the relationship between these terms in Blake's work. Here I'd like to look at a few key passages in place. Uh, uh, sorry, one of the work's climatic events rests strangely enough on a kind of poetic pun where the hero of the work, the poet John Milton, leaving heaven, eternity, and returning to the mortal world by joining with his poetic uh, scion Blake himself. Slide, please. Sorry. Milton enters Blake through the latter's left foot. The, thus, Blake quite literally incorporates his bardic predecessor uh, both into his own corporeal form and into his poetic meter, that is, into the feet of his own verse. And I quote, so uh, Milton's shadow fell, precipitant loud, thundering into the sea of time and space. Then first I saw him in the zenith as a falling star, descending perpendicular, as swift as the swallow or as or swift, and on my left foot falling on the Tarsus entered there, unquote. The long line of Blake's poetry, which some have identified as the 14er or the septenary, uh, a line of seven beats, um, <clears throat> sorry, in his prophetic works has been topic of much debate. It's certainly not among the verse forms that we usually associate with the epic or other narrative poetic structures. In fact, much of Blake's poetic work, Milton in particular, resists narrative interpretations. This would seem to be a strange claim regarding a poet who admired epic predecessors and chose a 17th century epic poet as the hero of his own epic work. I read uh, this resistance not just as an instance of artistic innovation, but more as a strategic defiance of normative poetic compulsions disguised as literary traditions. The, uh, this is not to say that Blake was unaware or dismissive of such traditions, far from it. Suffice to say that while we tend to think of Blake as an eccentric printmaker and prophet, he early on immersed himself in traditional poetic forms and conventions, especially meter and rhythm and rhyme, the sonnet, the ode, and other lyric forms. In short, he was an accomplished metricist. I know this because Blake's approach to the body and its senses in Milton aligns intimately with his rendering of time through prosody. Uh, 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 sorry, slide, please. Note the start of a long passage at the end of the first book. And I'll read some of this, but not the whole thing because it's quite long. But, but others of the sons of Los build, build moments and minutes and hours and days and months and years and ages and periods, wondrous buildings, and every moment has a couch of gold for soft repose. A moment equals a pulsation of the artery. And between every two moments stands a daughter of Beulah, 
to feed the sleepers on their couches with maternal care. And every minute has an azure tent with silken veils. And every hour has a bright golden gate carved with skill. And every day and night has walls of brass and gates of adamant, shining like precious stones and ornamented with appropriate signs. And every month a silver paved a terrace build it high, and every year invulnerable barriers with high towers, and every age is moated deep with bridges of silver and gold, and every se uh, seven ages is in encircled with a flaming fire. Now seven ages is amounting to 200 years, and each has its guard, each moment, minute, hour, day, month, and year, all are the work of fairy hands over of the four elements. The guard are angels of pure providence on duty evermore. Every time less than a pulsation of the artery is equal in its period and value to 6,000 years. Uh, for in this period, the poet's work is done and all the great events of time start forth and are conceived as such a period within a moment, a pulsation of the artery, unquote. I said that I wouldn't read the whole thing uh, and yet I did because it's so great I can't not read it. Um, Blake's attention to one of the body's own uh, temporal markers, the pulsation of the artery, is as powerful as it is peculiar. But before we come to the pulsation, we might wonder what is a moment? And more crucially, how might we understand Blake's rendering of a moment? The conventional definition suggests, a la the OED, a period of time, and I'm quoting, or more particularly an infinite, sorry, indefinite, uh, usually short, sorry, period of time, unquote. This definition seems to align the terms period, which Blake him, himself uses in the long passage I just read, with the term moment. John Locke, uh, uh, for whom Blake expressed hope and derision, nonetheless seems to anticipate Blake's conception of the term, quote, such a small part in duration may be called a moment and is the time of one idea in our minds in the train of their ordinary succession there, unquote. Locke's definition focuses upon the mental perception of a moment, uh, sorry, whereas Blake's use grounds that mental perception within the body itself, the pulse and the heartbeat. That is the foundation of poetic meter and rhythm. Crucially, Blake makes clear in this passage to distinguish between a moment and a minute, where moment parallels period in the, in the paratactical chain of figures that he, sorry, presents, and I quote, but others of the sons of Lowe's build moments and minutes and hours and days and months and years and ages and periods, unquote. And as the, the sons of, of Los build, so does Blake, deploying a lengthy anaphora to construct a framework of, of uh, sorry, temporal figurations, one upon the next upon the next. Um, um, I'm sorry, slide, please. In a part, part, sorry, in a particularly sensitive reading of this passage, Y. Chi Demock observes that, quote, for Blake, time is a built environment. There is nothing natural about it. It is not given, but made. This unnatural status of time is what enables human beings to dwell in it, to be sheltered by its walls, its tents, couches, and to leave their mark there, a labor intensive signature crafted brick by brick, the most gorgeous to come from human hands." Unquote. Demock's interpretation of Blake's passage or resonates deeply for the way in which it reads the conditions that both create temporal ableism, that is the, the discrimination against non-normative embodiments and people with disabilities, and, is, and necessitates a, a recognition of crypt temporality in the, the, the way that Kafer and others have described it. That is, Dimock's reading of Blake's temporality here acknowledges its very constructedness, that time is inherently an unnatural experiential form that has the potential to alienate non-normative subjects. Blake's remarkable uh, achievement in Milton, I would argue, is to move beyond the linearity of human time to multiple expressive modes of poesis. Well, 
One of these modes, of course, is printing. It is a lengthy process that requires effort and duration, not just to write and design, in Blake's case, and organize the materials needed to print, but of course, the preparation of the plates themselves. For Blake, the time spent covering a, a copper plate in hard ground, and then use sorry, and then the, the, the use of the etching needle to scrape away designs, the necessary time in the acid bath to bite his plates. The fineness, the particularity, and the, the uh, delicacy of the designs in Milton, a poem, suggest that a practiced attention of knowing how long to keep the plates in the acid bath to achieve the right etching uh, depth. Blake's printmaking methods defy the demands of modern media production in a way that invites non-normative creative potential and expression. Slide, please. As Kafer suggests, quote, may we, sorry, sorry, maybe he should, should think less of what crip time is and more of what crip time does. Thinking beyond specific speeds toward as yet unimagined imaginaries. What are the, the temporalities that unfold beyond, away from, a scance of productivity, capacity, self-sufficiency, independence, and achievement, unquote. Here I turn again to consider Blake's um, emphasis on the, the moment, specifically as the period the poet's work is done. Uh, for John Howard, Blake's rendering of imaginative endeavors in Milton hints, quote, that mental creativity demands, uh, 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 sorry, physical creativity, unquote. Indeed, Blake's hero, Milton, like Blake himself, is one of the bards who provides, quote, definite form, unquote, to poetic genius, the, sorry, divinity of imagination, just as Los gives the same to the world. Slide, please. In the poem, Blake notes that of the, this divine space, quote, the microscope knows not of this uh, nor the telescope. They alter the ratio of the spectator's organs, but leave objects untouched. For every space larger than a red globule of man's blood is visionary and is created by the hammer of Los, and every space smaller than a globule of man's blood opens into eternity. Of which, this of which this vegetable earth is but a shadow. The red globule is the unwearied sun by Los created to measure time and space to mortal men every morning, unquote. Uh, Blake's rejection of Newtonian materialism, which both uh, mediates and separates the human spectator from experiencing the world as it is, uh, I'm sorry, that is as infinite, is emblematized here by the microscope and the telescope, technologies of the so-called enlightenment bound up with Newton's treatises on optics, while Blake's insistence that the visionary expansiveness of these spaces, larger and smaller than, quote, a globule of man's blood, unquote, hints at the eternal. His real lament seems to be the loss of mystery and a connection with the, the divine as felt within the body itself. Uh, slide, please. As Blake argues, there is a moment in each day that Satan cannot find, nor can his watch fiends find it, but the industrious find this moment and it, it, it sorry, uh, sorry, find uh, uh, this moment and it multiply. And when it once is found, it renovates every moment of the day, if rightly placed, quote. Again, Blake's focus on the moment is significant. The moment belongs to the individual and eludes the satanic forces that threaten the poet's work. Um, sorry. Moreover, Blake's em emphasis on the industrious suggests the effort and determination of those willing to find the moment of creation, which is repaid with a fecundity and the renovation of time itself. Such multiplicity naturally bespeaks the work of the printmaker whose initial vision thus, uh, sorry, thus reproduces exponentially in material form. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, slide please. That said, each copy of Blake's work is unique. Even the, the scant four copies of Milton, a poem, 
each reveals remarkable visual variability and invites unique approaches of interpreting the text and images. Each encounter with Blake works not only um, to invite different readings, but, but also demands it. We can look at the title pages uh, of the four extant copies of Milton, a poem, as different moments, each conceived and experienced within a pulsation of the artery, each a variable starting from the same potentiality. Um, sorry, slide, please. On the four title pages, the uh, figure moving away from the viewer pushes apart the syllables of his name, right, Milton, as the trochaic foot of Milton's name disrupts the iambic rhythm commonly associated with the heartbeat we are drawn into and through the book itself. Quote, only by passing through the heart, argues Stephen Goldsmith, quote, following the lead of Milton at the start of his epic journey, can we grasp the deviant relationship between time and feeling that structures the work of emotion in Blake's poetry, unquote. The deviant relationship that Goldsmith identifies in Blake's Milton is, I suggest, emblematic of crypt time, wherein one's experience of the moment is always in tension, always out of sync with the constructed social world around us. But in that tension lies the energy for novelty, for innovation, and for progression. For as Goldsmith argues in, uh, in Milton, quote, Blake is exploring alter alternative ways of being in time, confounding distinctions between activity and passivity. His um, sorry, figures cannot be represented by the narrative of time, sorry, but by the narrative time of self-contained characters performing recognizable action sequences, unquote. Returning again to uh, Alison Kafer's formulation, quote, crypt time is flex time, not just expanded, but exploded. It requires reimagining our notions of what can and should happen in time or recognizing how expect, uh, sorry, how expectations of how long things take are based on very particular minds and bodies, unquote. Certainly Blake's collapse of conventional and then linear temporalities in Milton seeks to realize the, uh, um, sorry, this very reimagining, not just for the artist, but for his reader and viewer as well. What Kafer identifies as crypt time can, she says, quote, lead to feelings of asynchrony or temporal dissonance. Depression and mania are often experienced through time shifts. Now, Blake's, uh, so-called madness, a term and diagnosis I find troubling, is nonetheless useful for our purposes to, con to consider the lived experience of an artist who sought to free his readers uh, from the tyranny of what he conceived as Newton's errors. I'm sorry, slide please. Newton's conception of absolute versus relative time, right, measurable by by perceive, sorry, by perceivable objects in motion, reshaped an understanding of human experience under European Enlightenment thought. Blake's rejection of the materialism made possible by Newtonian delineation between, sorry, relative time and actual time finds, as I have been suggesting, specific expression in Milton. Again, I'm not, um, I'm sorry, suggesting that Blake's framing of space and time diminishes or rejects the sensual experience of what he called the vegetable world. Uh, on the contrary, as I've hoped to have shown, the physicality and recognition of material reality through which Blake structured his sublime allegories allows for a much wider and richer experience of the world within and through the body itself. Finally, I would argue that Blake's approach to printmaking breaks norms with its potential to dissolve the notion of the normate body by centering the individual as a singular instance of that textual corpus. If, as Ellen Samuels has suggested, quote, crypt time means listening to the broken languages of our bodies, translating them, honoring their words, unquote, then Blake's building of time from moments to minutes to hours to days to months to years to ages to periods simultaneously unmakes time, breaking experience into, as Blake says, uh, minute 
sorry, particulars uh, wherein the poet's work is done. Uh, uh, sorry, slide, please. Thank you. 